Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Aleš Kocourek. For those of you who may not know me personally yet, we will have a good chance uh, during the social evening uh, later on today. Uh, it is uh, a great pleasure and a huge honor for me uh, to invite all of you and welcome you here um, at the campus, at the main campus of the Technical University of Liberec. Uh, as you already probably know, the Technical University is currently celebrating its 70th, uh, 70th anniversary. It was established in 1953 and it is a pleasure for me that the support of the university uh, can be seen also here at the conference that we are organizing for the 16th time already. Uh, the rector of the Technical University was present at the coffee break. Uh, unfortunately, his agenda is too busy to stay longer, uh, but I'm sure that uh, some of you may recognize among ourselves also the Dean of the Faculty of Textile Engineering and also the Dean of the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering who will attend us uh, later on today. Also, our former rector, Professor Lukasz, is present here. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure. Uh, I must admit that we have some technical issues. One of these issues is the fact that uh, one of our keynote speakers is not ready yet. Uh, she uh, got stuck somewhere along the way. Uh, Dr. Helena Horska, she will attend us a little bit later, but that's not a big deal because uh, the first keynote speaker, Professor Rupert Baumgartner, is here on time. He arrived by Play, but by train yesterday already. Uh, he is, as you may probably know, uh, one of the biggest experts in sustainability and resilience in the European Union, and also a person whose uh, age index can be an inspiration for probably most of us here. Uh, he's uh, an excellent expert in sustainability and resilience, and uh, I would like you to welcome here on board uh, with an applause, please. Professor Baumgartner will start with his uh, presentation and I hope that in the meantime uh, Dr. Helena Horska will arrive so, so that we will get a chance to invite her also among us uh, during the afternoon. The stage is yours. Okay. I take that. Okay, thank you very much uh, Mr. Dean for the nice introduction. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether the biggest was meant regarding my size, or, uh, but uh, I'm honored to, to be here today uh, and to talk about uh, sustainable strategic management. Uh, this is a topic I'm working on since yeah, many, many years. Um, I have a basic education, therefore I'm happy to be here at the Technical University. I have a basic, basic education engineering. So, no? Okay. <laughs> oh, no, that was too fast. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, and already at that time, chemical process engineering, uh, the question of emissions, emission control, etc., was in focus, and uh, this didn't, uh, yeah, this this didn't go away over the years. Uh, but later, I focused on management. I'm now researching corporate sustainability and product sustainability. So, how to improve sustainability performance of businesses, of industrial companies mainly, uh, and of products. And in my talk, uh, I will not give you a short background about our own research, then something about the sustainability challenge, as I understand it, and then how to respond to that challenge from a corporate viewpoint, and how to um, <clears throat> integrate sustainability into strategy and strategic management, and something about change management and conclusions, uh, and it will be a um, tour de horizon, because we have about 30 minutes, maybe longer, I don't know whether uh, our colleague is able to come. Um, but anyway, um, you, will, um, have to, you will get the PDFs afterwards to have a deeper look into, into some points. 
Okay, uh, my background, I'm coming from the University of Graz. Uh, this is the second oldest university in Austria. Graz is the second largest city, but still we think uh, it's not a bad, bad place to be. I'm professor at the Institute of Environmental Systems Sciences. <clears throat> this uh, institute is an uh, interdisciplinary per, per nature, per design. Uh, we are five professors, about 45 people at the moment, and in my research group, as I said, it's about sustainability on the organizational level and on the product level. Um, <clears throat> our main research project, our flagship project, is our Christian Doppler Research Lab. This is a special funding program in Austria. This is funded by se for seven years, and it's 50% co-funded by three industrial companies. And we look into sustainability plus digitalization uh, plus decision-making processes uh, to understand how to improve sustainability performance of products by answering these uh, or working on these research aims so to operationalize sustainability. This is the focus also of my talk today. How can we translate that on the product level? How can digital technologies help here? How does decision-making processes look like? And by doing so, how can we better design products and better assess products? And you see here also a network of companies we are working with. Yeah, why is sustainability a topic at all? Maybe this can be explained by this uh, picture. You might have seen it already somewhere. Uh, I think since COVID, we understand more the drive of an exponential growth. And what we see here is an exponential growth since mid of the 20th century for almost all socioeconomic indicators and also the impacts. We are around 8 billion people today. We will be 10 to 11 in 30 years. And this, of course, is driving other developments. Yeah? We are uh, we're increasing our economy, so we have a remarkable GDP growth, means also more people have a higher living standard, but we need for that also more energy, more primary energy use. We need to, use, need to produce more uh, food, more fertilizers. We have a higher degree of urbanization. Per se, these are all not bad developments, but these developments come at the cost of some also environmental pressures. Yeah? It's climate change. We see here the uh, um, increase of carbon emissions. It's biodiversity as a global challenge and other global challenges. And <clears throat> you have here the nice, uh, very small iceberg, which was left over as, as a symbol. Um, and I think this is symbolizing it very well because what we can see is that we as human beings are shaping the planet Earth. Yeah? And some researchers say this could be called the Anthropocene. So what we as society in total are doing will have global effects. And this is what I tried to show before. And what is the consequence if we are really uh, in this time of an Anthropocene? This gives us an, a different role the first time ever in history, we are really responsible to take care about the planet. Yeah? It's really our decisions who will affect the future of Earth. And by the way, Earth will survive us. Yeah? Some climate deniers are saying, come on, we had carbon uh, concentrations much higher than today. Yeah, that's true. It's the speed of change which makes it complicated. Yeah, if you have a sea level rise of don't know how many meters, will challenging countries like the Netherlands, but especially the poorer countries. Yeah, so the speed of change is something we have to keep track on, and this makes the sustainability challenge an urgent challenge, I think, for humanity. Um, the international politics have reacted to that. These are the 17 uh, sustainable development goals. You might have seen always a different picture with the nice rectangles. I like this picture more because it shows the systemic dependencies between the SDGs. And we have four SDGs covering the state of the nature, the state of the environment. 
And this is the basis. We are depending on nature. And then there is the society. And then there is the economy allowing us to do things. Yeah? And not vice versa. So there's a systemic dependency in all we are doing. Um, and therefore, for me, sustainable development or sustainability, to be exact, is a systemic property. It's about a relation between systems. It's about embedding activities into a larger system. Yeah? So therefore, you can't define sustainability for a single product, a single company, or a single uh, material. Of course, you can do. But you have to define it in relation to the other systems the things are embedded in. And the reason is we are physically dependent on larger systems. We call this physicity. But also, we are from a societal and sociological perspective, depend on a larger system. So a company can't exist without employees, without the market, without the rule of law, without financial resources, also without uh, public acceptance. Yeah? And this is, I think, an important point to consider. Uh, so how to operationalize then sustainable development when everything is dependent and Everything is challenging and complicated. Um, there is a very nice model developed by colleagues in Sweden, uh, the Framework for Strategic Sustainable Development, uh, which operationalized this very nicely. This line is symbolizing the increasing population. As I said, we are going from 8 to 10, 11 billion people. But there's a second line. And this second line symbolizes the decreasing carrying capacity yeah? We see this uh, in regards of climate change. The remaining carbon budget is not very large to stay within a certain limit of temperature increase. So this is a kind of a funnel, a narrowing funnel. And sustainability is about stay within the funnel. And the problem is, at the moment, many indicators are showing us that we are trying to crash the wall. And that's never a very good idea to do that. So the big question is then, can we define these boundary conditions? And in this framework, there is a definition of these boundary conditions. These colleagues call them sustainability principles. And they have defined eight principles which are applicable on the product level, on the organizational level, at an, any organizations, at the community level, at the state level. And they are rather simple. Surprisingly simple. Uh, the first three are about environmental sustainability. It's about not changing natural conditions too fast and in to a too large uh, extent. Yeah? So it's about increasing concentrations uh, by substances from the earth crust, climate change. It's about introducing new substances into nature, microplastic. It's about cutting down or overfishing forests or the sea. And there are also um, social sustainability principles. The social system will only exist for a longer time if people do not get sick, if people can influence the system, if people can have um, uh, can express the competence, if they are treated fairly, and if they can express themselves. Yeah? So these are eight rather simple principles which we can apply on different uh, levels uh, wherever we are looking at. So what does this mean now for sustainable strategic management? <clears throat> the central question now yeah, is if you have a more holistic uh, perspective is how can companies operate successfully in these times of crisis we have? Yeah, it's not only the global environmental crisis. I mean, we know what Russia is doing in the Ukraine. We have a war again in Europe. We have many other political tensions and geopolitical challenges. We have had the supply chain interruptions globally. We have had uh, the pandemic. Yeah? And the question for a company is, okay, these are turbulent times. Yeah? 
And what should, could a company do to be successful, however we define successful here, don't go into that discussion at the moment, but still to survive, yeah? Short, medium, long term. And I think sustainability and circularity, circular economy, can be really uh, an important strategic angle for companies to be successful, yeah? So there's not only the normative argument to be sustainable, because we want to survive as humanity, but there's also a strategic motivation, yeah? Because done correctly, done in the right way, a more uh, integration of sustainability into the strategic management of a company, can the company make more resilient? Which is also one of the topics in your conference. First, let us look at the sustainability impact chain here. What everything a company is doing has an influence on the larger systems. Yeah? What is a company? A company is a system, a social system, transforming inputs to outputs. Yeah? And hopefully something from an economic perspective, uh, some of the outputs will find the market, the customer. Yeah? And economically speaking, you charge more than you pay for the resources. Then you are successful. How can you do that? Yeah? You need these activities, but maybe you need to have uh, a process to, to lead, to manage these activities. Yes, you need a kind of strategy. Strategy is very simple. A way to identify a way to go into the future. Yeah? You need to have goals, a vision for the future. You have to understand where you stand now. You have to have an understanding where to invest, where to develop competences, etc. This is all part of strategy. But there's also culture. It's a social system. Human beings, we, as, we now as human beings, we form a very short-term social system, but still a social system. You're still listening here, you don't run away. Uh, a company is maybe a more stable social system. And the way the managers, the owners, the employees see and perceive things forms the culture of this organization. And this will influence what is seen as important or not important. And we'll come back to this point a bit later. Okay, so a company transforms resources to an output. Yeah? So people are happy with your products. There's a positive impact you have. But there might be also other impacts, yeah? negative social or environmental impacts. So the company is doing something with a certain performance, and here are moderators, because the impact is also perceived somehow. I mean, in terms of climate change, we can measure the contribution of one ton of CO2 to global warming. But is it more relevant to focus on climate change than on child labor, than on biodiversity loss, than on working conditions at home? or on human rights. This is influenced by stakeholders and our perception of the world. Yeah? And this impact will influence, of course, the strategy. Yeah? So this is an important aspect. And a company can be successful if it has a fit of its strategy with the values yeah, which are expected by society, stakeholders, and other actors. Okay, um, what can be made more sustainable? That's quite simple. You can focus on the products and processes, so the organization is more sustainable. You as university, you buy renewable energy, you have maybe the no waste management, the no what else. But also you can deliver more products and services. I don't say now students are a product, but you can also make your students competent in sustainability. Yeah? Or you can say it, you can sell a technical product allowing the customer to be more sustainable. And of course, you can do both. What is important, and this is a very, for me a very important element, is much too often we are talk about, talking about less bad. Yeah? A little bit less of emissions, a little bit less of waste, but we are still doing the same thing. We should think about 
making a positive change. Yeah? So the vision should be zero impact positive outcome. Yeah? What can we do to really improve the state uh, of our systems? Yeah? This is translated into the management levels. Yeah? We can distinguish classically three management levels here again, the culture. So where, who are we as organizations? Who we want to be? This is written down in a purpose statement, an emission statement, things like that. The objective is here to get a license to operate, to get acceptance. Then it's about the strategic goals. It's about effectiveness, to go the right direction. And then it's the implementation at the operational level, to be really efficient. Yeah? And you have to be careful not to mix these levels up uh, in, in practice. Another element is uh, how can you integrate sustainability into the strategy? And here are four archetypes. You can be a, a risk avoidance company. You do as much as stakeholder pressure. You. We call this an introverted strategy. That's not really a sustainability strategy. We expect from every company to behave as a good citizen somehow. Yeah? Then you can focus on your internal processes. Yeah? We call this conservative strategy, especially for large industrial companies, an interesting strategy because reducing here sustainability impacts is usually also uh, beneficial from a cost perspective. Or focus on differenti differentiation. Yeah? Deliver something others can't deliver. Pro uh, position yourself as a company that is really sustainable. Yeah? So it's about image, positive relationships, license to operate. Or a visionary way is combining that. And we see many companies try to combine elements of these two. Still, I'm very reluctant to say that we have many visionary companies yet. Yeah, maybe that will be more in future. The important thing is, this strategy has to be specific, but also strategic. What does this, what does this mean? Specific means, Every company is different. If you're producing steel, you have different challenges uh, than as a service company. Yeah? And you can use here the sustainability principles I, pre I briefly mentioned before to understand the specific context from a sustainability perspective. And, of course, by doing so, you can contribute strategically to sustainable development. Yeah? Okay. How can we go for A to B? Yeah? So how can we make this happen in practice? And we did some research on change management and sustainability. Uh, and what we identified as very important element, uh, promoters of change, change agents. Yeah? People who can transform your organization. And that's, we think you need three of them. One is a power promoter, the person who has to say something, the person who can decide, or a group of persons. Then the expert promoter, a person who understands sustainability challenge, and the process promoter who can drive the change process. Yeah? And here you have, yeah, uh, an organ symbolize an organization, and you want to go to sustainability, you, you need to initiate that, you need to decide to organize the thing, to implement and to check the success. And these promoters will have different tasks in this journey. And what we have seen in all our studies is you need two core elements to be really successful. This is the top management support, of course. Yeah, that's nothing really new. And you need the willingness of the people yeah, the culture must be open for that. You have to have the values. And to, uh, to make that happen, there is then the role of the expert promoter. Yeah? To make this translation from the big, fluffy sustainability topic to the concrete actions, strategies, processes. So, companies with an identifiable change agent were more successful than others. We did a series of case studies here on small, medium-sized, and also large companies in Austria. The culture can drive the implementation. 
you can be super motivated as top manager, as CEO, or as owner of a company to be completely sustainable by tomorrow. And if your people think it's all a hoax, this will not work. Then you have to adapt to and have to integrate to start learning processes for the change. And we shouldn't be naive. Naive. There will be challenges between sustainability uh, and financial performance. We have many win-win-win situations, but there are also many win-lose situations. Yeah. Then it's a strategic decision how you far, how far you can go. Yeah. It's about balancing different time scales you have. Yeah. And companies accepting that. There could be a conflict between environmental, social sustainability and economic sustainability. Invest in a wider, wider range of activities. Because this is a resilience approach. Yeah? This increases the flexibility of the organization. Uh, and um, Because this fits now here. Uh, and this is also proven in, in research. Yeah? to have first the understanding, yeah? Where are the challenges between environmental, social sustainability, and economic sustainability? Then to have the culture and leadership willing to do something for sustainability, combined with uh, fluidity, a fast mobilization of resources. This is the recipe to deal with these challenges, because then you can quickly respond to opportunities and mitigate risks, yeah? And we call this uh, strategic agility as a very important element. Here, just briefly, the overview of the results uh, of our research in, for this change management. And we can see here, okay, there is a fast track to implement sustainability, but then you have to meet three conditions. The top management support, a culture which is open-minded, and the change promoters, understanding the change pro process and sustainability. We had two companies in that sample. Another company had the first two, but didn't really know how to manage the change process. This takes more time, because then you have to educate and incentivize employees. Also here it takes time. Because there's only partly support, there's a kind of reservation. Hmm, is this something you should go for or not? Or for the culture, it's also not fully clear. But there are people inside pushing for it. Yeah? So this could also work. Where it's definitely not working is, if culture is not fitting, management support is missing, then you can push inside as long as you will. It won't change. Yeah? OK. Um, here again, this role of values, which is very important. Uh, and also, there an, was a very interesting case, because there was a change in the ownership of one of our case companies. So there came a new CEO. The former owner and the former CEO was very committed towards sustainability. And the culture was also already developed in that direction. Yeah? And this, this didn't disappear overnight when the new CEO came in, who was not a fan of sustainability at all. But still, there was a kind of, yeah, resistance. No, no, not resistance. It, it was persistent somehow, yeah, that sustainability is important thing in, in that. Okay, we have been here. Does it pay off? That's always the important question. And of course it pays off if you do it right. I don't know if any of you is working in quality management or has experience or has some experience in that area. Is still anyone asking whether quality management is paying off? I don't think so. Yeah? Because there we know if you do it correctly, in the right way, it will pay off. Will, it will pay off. And it's the same for sustainability. And therefore, this understanding of the context and the translation of the challenges into those things where you can make a change in your strategy and business model, that's the key point to be successful. And what, we, what I can show you here is a, a survey study we did in Austria on the relation between innovation activities for sustainability and economic performance. And we looked also into the values and the culture of the organization. And the result is quite clear. 
the companies who were outperforming on the economic innovation performance, so who were able to deliver more innovative products and services uh, in an economic beneficial way, uh, were those who had a clear sustainable innovation strategy. Yeah? So without strategy, it won't work. But awareness, values, etc., is a catalyst. Yeah? So it supports uh, this relationship, but it doesn't work alone. Yeah? Of, I would say, of course, it doesn't work alone. Yeah? Um, so this is a very important thing. Yeah? Culture is a precondition, it's not a direct effect, but a clear strategy will help you to be economically successful. Okay, conclusions. Still more or less in time, I hope. Okay, um, top management support, clear leadership is crucial. Together with values and culture, open for sustainability, that's, that's really the thing uh, you, which will drive the implementation of sustainability into your organization. Yeah? And implementation means integrated into the normative level, into the vision, into the mission, into the purpose statement, into the strategic goals and strategic management processes, also and also finally uh, in the day-to-day -day processes and activities. So recommendations, strong vision, provide a clear picture why sustainability is important for your organization and what will be the benefit for you as organization but also for others. Link this vision also to the people and employees. Yeah? The, your, your employees understand uh, why they should do that. Another important point is it's a, it's a cross department topic. Yeah? It's going, it will affect all, um, all parts of your company and organization and need support of all uh, of your organization. And then we need these agents of change. Yeah? And accept these paradoxes, these tensions. Yeah, we're talking about different time scales. Yeah? Climate change, we're talking about 1.5 degrees, 2050 or so. But you have to uh, have your balance sheet ready by the end of the year. Yeah? So this, the, accepting this, this tension between these different time perspectives is a very important uh, thing. And I'm quite convinced uh, that done in a way like this can help both, can help uh, sustainable development, yeah? can be strategic for sustainable development, as I call it, but also strategic for a company. Yeah? This systematic integration of sustainability into business organization. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, an exciting introductory uh, speech. I think, I believe, we have some five, seven minutes for your questions. Uh, if any of you would like to ask Professor Baumgartner any question regarding his, uh, his uh, first lecture, please raise your hand so that we can uh, pass the microphone on to you, uh, because we are broadcasting and streamlining it uh, abroad. So, yes. Any questions? Thank you. May I ask you a question uh, regarding to uh, relationship between corporate social responsibility and uh, sustainable management because you know all of these concepts are based on three pillars economic social and environmental so where do you see these potential differences thank you yes thank you for your question um, first of all uh, CSR has has another uh, root and other background it was somehow in the United States developed in the 1930s already first uh, as as a way 
to help big companies not to be regulated, actually. Yeah? So there's a quite interesting story on that. Um, but the European Union, in, the, in their definition about CSR, they say it's more or less equivalent, yeah? because they talk also about environmental issues. Um, so for me, more or less, we can use it syn uh, as synonym, but this is not always the case. Yeah? Some still translate CSR only with this responsibility part, with some say, okay, this voluntary uh, things a company is doing, donating to civil organizations, things like that. This is important, yeah? but this is not sufficient from a sustainability perspective. And therefore, I like to talk more about corporate sustainability. So this is one, the first part of the answer. The other part is, uh, with the picture of the SDGs, I tried to show the systemic dependence. Yeah? And I find the three pillar or the triangle, I find these uh, pictures about sustainable development horrible. Yeah? Because um, they, they show it like you can exchange one for the other. And that's not possible. Yeah? So it's not about, uh, that's a weak sustainability approach, yeah? Being richer but having less nature, more or less. This does not work uh, as, as many researchers have shown before. Therefore, I, I like to talk more about corporate sus uh, sustainability, corporate sustainability, sustainability management than CSR. And one also acknowledge this dependent nature of, of the systems. Don't hesitate. It's an excellent opportunity. And I also have a question, so uh, yeah, over there, over there. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank for the in interesting presentation first. And my question uh, goes to, uh, do you have some specific recommendations how to implement sustainable sustainability in small and medium-sized enterprises in contrast to big, bigger companies? Because mm -hmm. it is a big issue now. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, small and medium-sized companies have an advantage and have a disadvantage. The, the disadvantage is they have no slack of resources. Yeah. So they can't use an and bureaucratic approach for doing so. The advantage is that they can react much faster. Yeah? So my, my advice would be to, to think about the simple sustainability principles and try to understand where they would, uh, where they fit to the activities an SME is doing. I do not recommend uh, that there are small companies implementing an ISO standard or some bureaucratic tools, they are just instruments developed for large companies. Yeah? Try to avoid that. Try to start with your understanding as an SME what means sustainability for you. And every organization can make a small contribution to it. You don't have always to have the super perfect starting point. Yeah? Is this enough? I guess we can have one or two last questions. One is mine. Uh, you, you mentioned the role of the culture and the government uh, in the concept of uh, achieving the sustainability. Uh, what if the government is more skeptic? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, I, I mentioned culture for, within the organization. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, the, the thing is, I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk about politics <laughs> at, at large. Um, what? How to say it? Yeah, I, I can say one thing. Yeah, uh, I thought. Or what can we see on the policy level? Is uh, first of all, I think from the European Commission, with the new Green Deal and other plans, I think they have the right ideas. Yeah. 
What I'm disappointed about is, and here talk more about my country because I know that better than your country is, I thought after the start of the Russian war last, last year, we would not talk about should we invest in renewables, should we invest into energy efficiency, things like that. I thought this would be for granted. And what we see in my country and on the European level is that the, that the big fossil fuel companies are heavily lobbying against that. And so this is a real political problem we have. Yeah. Coming back to organizational culture, <laughs> uh, because uh, I, have, I don't have an answer to this, to this topic. But uh, when we say this is so important with a company, we have also to understand it's not easy, it's a learning process. Yeah? So a culture of an organization, uh, the values you have is a result of learning processes. Yeah? So if you want to then develop a company, an organization, a university to be more open for sustainability, you have to give the people the chance to learn. Yeah? And you learn because you see a good example, you learn because you understand the topic better. Yeah? So also ed education, uh, uh, things like that. And you learn by persistence. Yeah? So don't change every six months your idea about sustainability. Yeah? So this would might be my short and simple answer to the easier part of your question. Perfect, thank you very much. I can also see where our role of the university uh, steps in the problem. So yeah. I guess we also have our uh, homework to do. We have time for one last question to Professor Ngbang. Ah, okay, Suska. Are some, uh, if there are some companies who already implement your ideas or your recommendations in the uh, Graz or Styria region? Yes, we have companies working uh, with, with such ideas. Uh, some of them have, I have shown here on the, um, on the slides uh, with, with our case studies. Um, we work mainly with industrial companies. Yeah? So at the moment, uh, we work a lot with uh, the steel and automotive industry on these topics um, but I would like myself I would like to see always more than I see yeah. <laughs> so to say yeah but um, some elements I think are already underway somehow yeah but of course the the pressure the companies perceive now because of the energy price situation also the European regulations, etc., also increased a lot, for instance, uh, the interactions we have also with practice. So when I look back 10 years ago, you have, I was more, uh, yeah, companies were not so intensively approaching us at the moment. Uh, they run through our door, I would say, yeah. So they understand there is something going on. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> uh, thank all of you for, uh, for an interesting discussion. You can obviously uh, address Professor Baumgartner later in the afternoon or in the evening. He's joining us for the social evening as well. So you still, if you hesitate to ask uh, now, you can definitely use the opportunity later on. Uh, thank you, Professor Baumgartner, for an excellent performance. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you also for the nice questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as you already see, our second keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Horska, is, uh, has already arrived. Thank you for arriving. Uh, you probably know her as a chief economist of Raiffeisen Bank, also as a member of the uh, National Advisory Board of Czech Government. And she's obviously an iconic Czech economist, so I'm very happy that you accepted our uh, uh, invitation and um, the stage and the auditorium is yours. Thank you. So where should I take? Oh, you may, you may. oh this one. Okay, thank you. So, hello everybody and thank you for uh, having me here. I'm really glad to be here again on the academic uh, platform, not only at the TV or uh, the bank uh, meetings. 
uh, I would like to continue with the macroeconomic issue, but first of all, I at the same time wouldn't like not to take the topic for a follow-up discussion. But uh, as uh, your, uh, you have seen the presentation regarding the changes in uh, companies or the business level, I know these uh, changes uh, privately, and I know that uh, at least in my view, lots of things and lots of ideas are applicable at the political or government levels. Because what we are seeking and what we are like calling for is the vision. We know the Friday speech of our prime minister about the vision. We need the change of the thinking of the government employees. This would be the big and very important, maybe the, uh, the, the toughest uh, things. We also know that uh, we uh, need the change of the culture in the service sector, in the government services, in government institutions. We know that the government definitely needs a called agile approach to the problems and to the crisis uh, stuff. What it doesn't mean agile, we do in the banking sector a lot. Almost all projects are agile project. What does it mean? It means that the people from different uh, sectors and different departments are connected to one project and sitting in one room and solving the problem from different point of views. And this is exactly what the government needs to do as well. And one thing during at least the COVID crisis and energy crisis, we saw that the government, at least under big pressure from the business, from the households, is able to do and to apply at least partially the agile approach because like uh, uh, the economic advisor team was asked to help to government to react on the energy and price crisis or there was another expertise group uh, that uh, were solving the energy crisis uh, at the government level. So we know that it makes sense and it's good to know that even if there is some shock or crisis, the government, thanks to connection with uh, the uh, free parties, would say independent experts, to apply the agile approach. And this is, this is something that I see for the future, the possibility how to make uh, even the reaction of the government more flexible and more, would say, expert-driven than political-driven. But still, government is politicians, and it's about the politics, and should be such. But if there is something that needs to be solved, we know already, and we have experienced uh, the possibility that connection between the government and business and expertise level is possible to do. And that, that's, in my view, all what we can connect it together. And now, please, let me start with my topic. Since I'm the macroeconomist, I'm not ESG guy, not yet. Maybe I will switch, maybe in the future, because to be ESG, it's very sexy now. So guys who would like to be sexy in the uh, next uh, entry of the labor market, please use the ESG topic or ESG uh, position, because if there is uh, the only um, department that is growing in banking sector is ESG, while the others are reducing regarding the costs. So my topic, uh, if I'm speaking or if I'm thinking even about the sustainability, I'm thinking about the sustainability growth, sustainability increase in our living standard, sustainability increase in our wages, sustainability increase uh, of our pricing level. And also because of we went through very tough and terrific uh, shocks in recent years, I say it's perfect storm. I also add another topic, and this is economic resilience. I think the, these two topics are for me now, would say the key elements and key aspect that I'm thinking every day about them. And 
think that this is also important for us as a macroeconomist or theoretical economist that needs to uh, thinking about it. So uh, I need to change the slide. So uh, definitely what may help me to explain the concept of uh, economic sustainability and resilience. I use very nice graph, or you can see it's like the donuts, uh, that it uh, show you the uh, sustainability development goals of OECD. Why I'm using uh, such, uh, would say, uh, the graph or the publication is because it shows you all the elements that we need to thinking about and need to tackle if we are speaking about the sustainability and economic resilience. Because it's not only about the GDP and if the GDP or the uh, value added went up by 0.4, or 0.2 percent in last quarter, or if we will stagnate this year and uh, increase the, the GDP level next year by two or two and a half percent. The question is more about the long-term sustainability growth, about uh, the price stability, about the stability of uh, incomes of households, the poverty, the health of households, and many, many other aspects. So economic uh, uh, resilience and economic sustainability can't be measured by only GDP or CPI or trade imbalance or interest rates, but we need to look uh, on a wider uh, range of indicators. This is also why I like this graph, these, uh, would say, this donut, because it shows us especially the Czech Republic. Here is a result of uh, the situation of Czech economy in uh, 2010. So it was uh, just ahead of the uh, COVID uh, shock. It was uh, ahead of energy and price shock. So some of these indicators will look uh, like today a bit different. But if we look on the graph, like looking to, to 2010 uh, in the Czech Republic, we can see that the most uh, uh, gap or the biggest gap uh, that the Czech Republic uh, uh, had was in the case of uh, the education. So we are here exactly to discuss it because uh, I think we still speaking about the change in education. How many years? How many decades? From the very early 90s, last century? Yeah. So we're from the beginning of economic transition, and it's still not solved. At the same time, the health system is also not really uh, cost efficient, but it's still very, uh, at least with high, high quality that we receive from our health system. The question is how long it will take and how long uh, the system will be stable. Uh, regarding the economic uh, development, we are not so bad uh, like in the case of education, but still it's topic and I will, uh, if you don't mind, will focus on that uh, very soon. So this is the result or uh, this is uh, the situation of Czech Republic and if we're looking more about the current uh, stance and current development, Please let me start with the economic uh, development and uh, the economic level convergence. Because uh, you have heard recently lots of stories about the middle income trap of the Czech Republic. This is exactly what uh, we are, uh, would say, focusing or targeting as a macroeconomist, that the Czech Republic, as you can see in the graph, stop to converge uh, after the global financial crisis. We were not able to grow ahead and uh, uh, get closer to most developed uh, countries EU. Of course, we overtake uh, Italy, we overtake Greece, we overtake Spain, but it's enough. Should we, should we be happy that we are in uh, 
theory of uh, GDP per capita in pollution and power parity uh, above Spain, it's enough, or we should improve it. Because if you look on Poland, also on Hungary, for they start with a significantly lower economic level, they are still converging. Especially in uh, Poland, uh, the uh, conversion of Poland is more sustainable, I would say, than uh, in the case of Czech Republic. So it's also a bigger economy, so they have more, in many cases, uh, more advantages than we are, but they are able to use it uh, for their, for their uh, better future. Another topic is extreme inflation. I think uh, everybody here uh, knows the data about the uh, inflation in Czech Republic, about the double-digit uh, growth and the, the outlook that it's thought it's positive that we should not have any more double-digit inflation. But the question is if the inflation will uh, decelerate to 2% or according my view and our forecast, will stay above 2% at least for the next couple of months and even the next year. So the return to the inflation target of the Czech Nation Bank may take a longer time, longer than the Czech Nation Bank is expecting uh, in their forecast or its own forecast. So the price stability is very important because why? Price stability only reflects the unsustainability, the structural problem of Czech economy, which is again labor market. And the, uh, the third graph in this uh, slide show you thought it's nice that we have uh, the lowest unemployment rate, almost the lowest, time to time it's Malta behind us, but almost one of the lowest unemployment rate in, Czech, uh, in the EU. But problem is that uh, the, the companies are uh, not able to found not only qualified, but even unqualified the labor force. So this is, generally speaking, uh, the, ha uh, the strongest obstacle of economic growth in the Czech Republic. So great, we have the lowest unemployment rate, but at the same time, we have very gradual or even declining productivity growth in, uh, in uh, GDP terms per uh, capita. We also have a problem uh, to, I would say, activate uh, the uh, labor reserves, not only mother, mothers and young women, and you, ha you are here as well, also young students that are leaving our country, not coming back, or the women are leaving the labor market and not coming back soon, at least in the, in the age of uh, 20 and 35. You, you know that the, the, the employment of the woman in the early age of, uh, of uh, uh, labor activity, uh, 19 to 35, is the lowest in the EU. So even uh, the domestic reserves are very huge. We can activate uh, the labor forces that are available here in Czech Republic. Uh, the woman employment can be also increased but it needs some changes. Not only the service for families, so including uh, the schools, preschools, and other stuff, but also we should speak about the uh, migration, would say selective migration, because uh, if we would like to shift to more advanced and also uh, the knowledge-based economy, we definitely will need uh, uh, higher educated people that will be able to uh, cope with the new challenges, new technologies, and adjust uh, to the new task. Another uh, thing is uh, the uh, structure of the Czech economy. We know that uh, together with Germany and uh, uh, Ireland, we are the most industrial economy. That's fine. That's not bad, of course. But if uh, there is some crisis that uh, uh, has negative impact of, uh, on our industries, uh, then the Czech economy is falling down into recession very fast and in very deep recession. 
We also has a very significant, and you know, this is the region where the automotive sector is very active. So we, we know that uh, the big share, still close to 9% of GDP of automotive sector is uh, uh, one of the highest uh, um, between many, many countries. But at the same time, I would like to also show you some data regarding the IT and e-commerce sector because we, uh, we speak, uh, uh, in my view, uh, uh, not too often about the increasing sector, e-commerce, IT, that is already approaching 8% of GDP. So it's very close to the share of uh, the automotive sector. And nobody, at least from the government, is caring off. Everybody's speaking about the automotive sector, about the Kurzarbeit, about the antivirus, how to support uh, and, uh, in my view, make stable employment in the same structure as was used to be 10, uh, uh, 10 years ago. So we are not changing and we are not helping to flexibility to the market, to changing the structure of employment, to changing the structure of economy. Uh, while we are supporting uh, to stay, to stay where we are, to stay what we are producing and stay what uh, we had uh, uh, in the past. So in my view, it's also the question of how to make our labor market more flexible and maybe more, uh, more resilient. So flexibility of the model of uh, Danish or other countries is something that may help us to change the structure, not only of the structure of economy, but also the structure of uh, employment. But back to the structure of economy. So don't forget that also we are uh, facing uh, uh, great uh, potential in the case of IT, technology, uh, cybersecurity, e-commerce, and fourth, uh, we register now decline of uh, the e-commerce. In my view, it's just uh, the correction of uh, the COVID boost. This is normal, but still, if you compare the trend, the long-term trend, the e-commerce and IT is still growing uh, uh, above the long-term trend. So the COVID correction is something healthy, in my view, and it's a time to expect that this sector may be very interesting for the future. And not speaking about the AI, we can speak about the AI later on, because part of this presentation is powered by AI. So, not too fast, so energy intensity. We should also uh, remember, and I think uh, we, uh, we already saw the impact of uh, what uh, will happen or what would happen if uh, the energy prices uh, shock the economy or uh, put, the, put the, our economy under pressure. Uh, so we are uh, the fifth most uh, intensive, uh, energy intensive economy in the EU. And of course, it's connected to our uh, sh uh, big share of uh, industry uh, in our economy. So the problem is that uh, what we have uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, power regarding uh, the uh, green energy, the green sources of our energy sector or energy consumption is still very low. We still are based on, would say, unclear, not green uh, energy sources. And the question is uh, what uh, the government uh, will do with that. And uh, the discussion at EU level regarding uh, the nuclear power is very, very important for us because it will uh, have an impact uh, on uh, our uh, strategy and uh, the structure of energy production and finally consumption. So this is uh, still a big issue and I hope uh, that uh, our, would say, positive things, nuclear power, uh, that it's relatively and the cheapest uh, source of our energy will stay with us and that we will able to uh, invest into it and to promote it in, uh, in the Czech Republic and also support the part of our uh, neighbors because lots of neighbors, including Austria, are dependent on our uh, nuclear powers. For they don't like to hear. 
Another, poverty. This is something that uh, should be also uh, tackled here because it's nice to see the economic growth. It's nice to speak about the low unemployment and for a relatively gradual increase of, of uh, employment. But if the people feel uh, pressure, feel uh, budget constraints, the economy is not able, and we saw it, to recover fast. So the problem the, uh, the Czech, uh, of the Czech economy is not only that uh, uh, we, uh, we get uh, into middle income trap and fall into, into middle income trap. We also have a problem to recover for any crisis. Remember that. After the global financial crisis, what uh, happened that time? We had very slow, gradual recovery. Finally, the central bank decided to intervene against the currency to, would say, wake up the economy. The uh, result was exhausted labor market, wage pressures, and accumulation of inflation pressure that we saw last year as, uh, I would say, uh, the, uh, the, the wine that is boom up or some bubble burst. So the problem of the Czech economy is also, uh, is also about the stability of uh, domestic demand. We still are very open economy. We still are very dependent on export. But as the story of uh, Asian countries uh, showed us, uh, the stable economic growth can't be based only on one part of uh, GDP structure or only one part of expenditures, not only on exports. We also need to stabilize the domestic demand. So if we look on the data, it's nice that Czech Republic has relatively equal distribution, but relatively, please, relatively equal distribution of income. But the problem is that one third of Czech households after the COVID and energy shock are not able to save any one currency, any one corona. So they spend what they get. So while even other households, they even oversaved during the COVID. The oversaving in Czech Republic after the COVID in uh, overall economy is still more than 200 billion Czech crown. It's still very, very high. But th the problem is that these oversaving, it's uh, uh, concentrate in the upper and with higher income uh, people. So there is no equal distribution of oversavings in economy, of course. And if you look on the, the third graph on the right side, you can see that even the high income people register some uh, uh, budget constraints, but of course they have the reserves. They are able to absorb the shocks, but even on, on them, the cost or the price pressure and the post-COVID uh, shock uh, has or had impact and significant one. We do not see here on the graph uh, the impact of the tax uh, changes during 2021 and 2022. Uh, this definitely help uh, to middle and higher income households to increase the net income. And also, this is also why the people with uh, higher income has also higher over savings. So all these uh, changes, changes in, uh, uh, in the support of household, changes uh, in transfers during the COVID, and also changes in tax system, had definitely significant uh, impact on the distribution of income uh, of Czech households. Now what we are facing, and lots of people are uh, discussing uh, yesterday, the, the another fall in a row of a real uh, average uh, wages in the Czech Republic. Fourth is the longest decline in our young history. 
I maybe next time will show you the graph that uh, just uh, depicted uh, the gap between the real productivity growth and the real wages, average, average we should add. And there was the gap. While during the uh, last two decades, uh, the real wages went significantly up by uh, roughly, if I remember correctly, correctly 35%. The productivity growth over 20 years went up uh, uh, significantly uh, uh, less by roughly 10%. So there was more than uh, 25 percentage points uh, gap. And what happens now? We are back. So the real uh, wages are back when the productivity is. So this is exactly what we did and what we, what we saw in the case of Greece. The significant increase of real incomes that overshadowed uh, the uh, increase in real productivity and it was followed by but really huge and huge correction. And we went through this correction last three years. Very fast correction. So now we are back, and according to our, uh, to our expectation, uh, return to the pre-COVID real wages will take roughly two years to return. But at the same time, we need to work on our, in, on our productivity growth, because the way to uh, hire educated and higher value added economy and base knowledge economy is, and what we can definitely discuss, it's not through the higher wage economy, but through the higher value added economy. And then we get the higher income and higher wages and convergence of the economic level and convergence of uh, the income level as, uh, as, as the same time. So the last thing, because I like the health story and I like the health. I'm also the member of uh, some uh, public initiative. It's Ministry of Wellbeing with Tomasz uh, uh, Shebek. We are supporting uh, the prevention. But what does it mean? Why we are focusing on uh, the preventive uh, approach? Because if you look on the graph, uh, uh, our average uh, life span is increasing gradually, but it's increasing. The problem is that the number of years in which we are health, it's not really increasing. We are entering our 60s not healthy. Why? Because our, I would say, living standards or living uh, behavior or, I would say, also food behavior, it's not very healthy and we need to change it. What we can also make and what we can also change is uh, the share of uh, uh, expenditures that are coming uh, to the preventive or after preventive uh, health system. Because we are solving the problem, but we are not preventing the problem. If we look uh, what's the share of uh, uh, outlines uh, or expenditures to prevention program, it's less than 10% of all the expenditures that are coming into health system, less than 10%. So 90% is going to the unhealthy uh, people that need to help at least or need to some, some uh, uh, steps uh, to increase or to improve their health. Uh, at the same time, we are uh, facing the uh, aging population. So we need also to tackle it uh, in a pension system, in health system, in education system, in everywhere. Uh, companies, and we are back to the companies and uh, also the company culture, the companies need to 
improve not only the uh, uh, equality between women and men, but also uh, between the different ages. I mean, uh, the company needs to know and needs to start to thinking how to how to use also the old, I would say, older or would say seniors or senior uh, knowledge people because uh, the population, the average population is becoming, and this is the trend, the long-term trend, is becoming uh, elder. And this is the fact, this is not the forecast, this is the fact. So, this is uh, something, and these are the topics that uh, I'm thinking about if we are speaking about the economic sustainability, about the economic resilience. And I hope that we can, some of these topics, discuss it and maybe also find the ways how to solve some of the problems, not only in education. I think we can start definitely with education and then we'll finish at labor markets, definitely, I hope so. But also, we can also discuss what uh, make us better in the future because we need to apply the vision into practice steps. Because vision we have, we have many of them, but we do not have the real steps and real action. So let's to act and maybe speak less next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for a uh, very interesting contribution. Now we have another eight minutes for some questions uh, before uh, we go for the coffee break. And after the coffee break, you will have a chance to discuss further uh, with Dr. Uh, Helena Hovska. Uh, you can also discuss in Czech during the next session. But now, uh, are there any questions in English? Are there any Pioneers? Okay. On the heart. Thank you um, very much. Uh, uh, what caught my eye uh, was the uh, last slide where you presented uh, that we are entering our 60s uh, unhealthy. Uh, do you have a comparison with other European countries? Are we generally more sick than other countries or are we generally more healthy? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we are less healthy, especially uh, compared to Nordic countries. Uh, uh, I would say Netherlands, uh, Sweden, Finland, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and also at the, uh, even the Germans are more healthy in the 60s than we are. So definitely there is some gap uh, between the, would say the average and definitely a big gap uh, uh, between the most healthy populations uh, in Europe. So definitely, this is something that needs to be needs to be tackled or not solved, you know. But start to thinking about it because the prevention is definitely cheaper than the solving the problems afterwards. And if we will face the aging population, uh, more budget constraints, less sources, then we also need to think about the efficiency. So. I'm also very happy that new uh, technologies like the watches, other rings, all these things can help us to make our life uh, healthier. And it's about uh, yeah, the regime, what we are eating, what we are doing, how often we are making a sport. All this stuff definitely has significant impact on our health uh, in the 60s. And there are many, many research on that, and very nice and very positive one. Thank you. So that's something let's that, go jogging. <laughs> that's something that caught my eye, actually. Even uh, coffee you, is healthy, you know. <laughs> I'm not a coffee drinker, I'm sorry. Uh, you mentioned that we are spending 10% of the health budget on prevention, but now... Only. 
only 10 percent but now you mentioned the the other thing the other side of the story that prevention is much cheaper actually mm -hmm. so isn't it enough maybe 10 percent is quite okay if you consider if you compare the 10 percent for prevention with the price of i don't know cancer operation or or you know mm -hmm. obviously tackling the problem later is much more expensive but doesn't that mean also that the expenses that we are spending on prevention and on the after uh, uh, after care, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you for the question because exactly it's about uh, the price of uh, the uh, house system. But I maybe answer your question uh, uh, about through the Danish uh, target and Danish uh, program. Uh, and uh, uh, or the Danish government decided uh, to have in uh, 20 years uh, half and half budget. So to put half of the budget uh, for health system uh, into prevention and half after care. So I think they definitely calculate that. And we are very, not only compared to current stands in other countries, we also are still lagging behind uh, the plans that other countries are already preparing. So look on the data of uh, uh, World Health uh, Association or organization, and uh, there are many initiatives regarding the increase of prevention, and there are lots of nice, uh, even uh, animation or graphs, or uh, would say uh, some uh, a promotion of uh, health, uh, uh, health living uh, standards and regimes that we can change or the regime changes that we can do and just uh, help uh, to improve our uh, health uh, situation after late 16. I'm doing that. I hope I will do more. <laughs> if I will have time for that. <laughs> well, thank you. We still have time for one last question, I believe. So it's also why I'm walking during uh, the lecture because my watch is still saying, please move, please move. Your heart beating is still very low. <laughs> Thank you, now. Okay, I just have a question. It's not really a database question. It's rather about your opinion, your feeling, your intuition. Like, do you think we can do this as a Czech Republic? Like, are we able to survive like everything that is ahead of us with the people we have, you know, in the government, in the state structures? Because for me, it feels that we are way too slow, way too slow. Um, those people should know already everything, you know, they should know the data, they should know what's ahead of us, they know most of these numbers. I don't see enough action that I would like to see. How do you feel about it? Like, are you optimistic or positive or rather not? I will use my intuition, may I? <laughs> uh, so my intuition after one and a half year experience in uh, Nation Economic uh, Advisors team is that uh, we need to uh, we need to like uh, go against the wall, and when we reach the wall, we will do the changes. But we haven't yet, I'm afraid, reached the wall. So I'm afraid of that because I think we feel to fall on the ground to start doing something. So I would like to say yes, there would be, and there is, definitely there is initiatives, there's lots of initiatives that would like to change uh, the trend and turn, uh, would say, the circle behind we reach the wall. But the reality and the political reality, as I saw a, a bit inside, but mostly outside, is that the population as a whole population, it's not really willing to absorb and to say we need to do the unpopular changes. Part of the population 
know that we are very close to the wall. They would like to see the changes, but the rest of the population is against any negative changes, unpopular changes. And we do not have, I think, the politicians, generally speaking, that are able as a visioners or like really strong person explain the people and our population that the changes are really needed. We try to do that. I think all the experts that are speaking in media are saying this is not sustainable. We need to change it. We, we do some changes, but finally, uh, it, during the political process, uh, the adjust, there is some adjustment. The final result, it's more or less plus minus. So we are not really satisfied. But I think everybody from us know that we need to do the changes. But the big part of population is not ready to take all the costs that we need to do. So I'm afraid, my intuition is, that uh, we will have a, like we will survive next couple of years, but then another shock will come and we will be without any reserves, without any reserves. And our public deficit may be very close to 60% of GDP, our uh, uh, GDP growth will be very slow, productivity almost stagnating, car industry will be down, and uh, e-commerce will leave the country. And at that point, we will change. Thank you. That's I not... hope that I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, much better conclusion, actually. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, uh... we were last and overlasted the best forecaster in the Czech Republic. So, <laughs> I like the part, you know, less talk and uh, more action. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, please um, give a nice applause to Helen Horska. Thank you. And let me invite you for a coffee and a short coffee break. We will start the further discussion table at 4 p.m. exactly. Thank you. Small walk. Thank you. <laughs>